visit your house, please? Hey. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from John Russell, Dan Friedel, and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is John Russell. Israeli archaeologists said they have discovered about 80 new pieces of ancient writings, known as Dead Sea Scrolls, in a desert cave south of Jerusalem. The writings are the first new scrolls to be found in 60 years. The writings are religious in nature. They have lines written in Greek. They are believed to have been hidden during a Jewish revolt against the Romans nearly 1,900 years ago. The Israel Antiquities Authority says, based on the writing style, they likely come from the first century. The new discovery adds to a larger group of Dead Sea Scrolls, a collection of Jewish writings first found in desert caves in the West Bank near Qumran in the 1940s and 1950s. Some of the scrolls date to over 2,000 years ago. They include the earliest known copies of biblical writings and documents explaining the beliefs of a little understood Jewish group. The roughly 80 new pieces were found in a place known as the Cave of Horror. It has the name because 40 human skeletons were found there during digs in the 1960s. The cave is about 40 kilometers south of Jerusalem. The scrolls were found during an operation by the Israel Antiquities Authority. The goal was to find scrolls and other ancient objects to prevent possible stealing. The writings are believed to have been part of a scroll put in the cave during the Bar Kokhba revolt. This was an armed Jewish revolt against Rome during the time of Emperor Hadrian in the years between 132 and 136. Oren Abelman is a Dead Sea Scroll researcher with the Israel Antiquities Authority. He noted a difference between the newly discovered writings and other known writings in Hebrew and Greek. Joe Uziel is head of the Authority's Dead Sea Scrolls group. He said, Some of those differences are important. Uziel added, Every little piece of information that we can add, we can understand a little bit better how the biblical writing came into its traditional Hebrew form. In 1961, Israeli archaeologist Yohanan Aharoni led a dig in the Cave of Hor. His team found nine pieces of writing belonging to a scroll written in Greek. Since then, no writings have been found during archaeological digs, but many have been sold in illegal markets. They were apparently taken from the caves. For the past four years, Israeli archaeologists have launched a major campaign to examine caves in the Judean desert. The aim is to find ancient objects before people damage the area, destroying important information in search of objects to be sold illegally. 
The authority said since the beginning of the operation in 2017, there have been almost no antiquities stolen in the Judean desert. I'm John Russell. Welcome to Happy Cork. That is how Sunshine Foss welcomes people into her wine store in Brooklyn, New York. She opened the store in 2018. Today, Foss is one of a growing number of black people in the wine industry. She said she speaks with black winemakers who tell her many owners of wine stores are not interested in buying wine from them. So for me, it's extremely important to be able to give this platform to a lot of these Black-owned winemakers. Foss carries wines from all over the world, but she pays special attention to those made by African Americans. The store now sells wine offerings by American singers Mary J. Blige and John and basketball star Dwayne Wade. When she first opened her store, however, she found it hard to find wines made by black people. But now people know about her store and ask her to sell their wine. Phil Long lives in Northern California. He started the Association of African American Vintners. He also owns a company called Longevity Wines. He said membership in his organization has grown by 500% since 2019. But he noted that people like him have a lot of work to do to reach their goal of making more people know about wine made by black winemakers. He said there are only about 25 black-owned wineries out of the thousands in the U.S. Once I realized how few there were, and I started understanding the um, non-diverse landscape, that's when it became more of an element of who I am. Long said he chose to get into the winemaking business after having to wait a long time to be served while visiting a winery near Santa Barbara, California. I stood there waiting, and no one ever acknowledged me, Long said. Kristen Braswell owns a travel business. She started holding wine-tasting events by video during the coronavirus pandemic. She thought it would be a good way to show winemakers that black people are just as interested in learning about wine as white people are. Steve Byfield owns Nyarai Cellars in Ontario, Canada. He said he and other black people in the wine business are trying to show that our place is very much valid like anybody else's in this industry. I'm Dan Friedel. In science fiction movies, there are many examples of spaceships racing through space at the speed of light. Or faster. But is faster than light travel possible? A new research paper written by an American physicist has proposed a theory for how faster than light travel could be possible. The research was carried out by Eric Lentz, who did the work at Germany's University of Göttingen. Lentz and his team 
believe that travel to distant stars and planets could be possible in the future. But this can happen only if space vehicles travel faster than the speed of light. Light can travel at about 300,000 kilometers in one second. Physicist Albert Einstein's famous theory of relativity suggests that it is not possible to travel faster than light. As a result, the latest research on the subject has centered on theories beyond normal explanations of matter. They call hypothetical particles and states of matter with unusual physical properties to permit faster-than-light travel. This kind of matter either cannot be found or cannot be manufactured in necessary amounts, the paper states. The new paper places more importance not on theoretical research but on a possible engineering solution. The research describes a plan to permit superfast travel by creating a series of what the researchers call solitons to provide the basis for a powerful propulsion system. A soliton is a compact wave that keeps its speed and shape while moving with little loss of energy. The research suggests that such a method could permit travel at any speed. The results recently appeared in the publication Classical and Quantum Gravity. The method uses the very structure of space and time arranged in a soliton to provide a solution to faster-than-light travel, said a press release explaining the process. Lentz told Reuters news agency that such a warp drive technology could be used to sharply reduce travel times. That could make future travel to distant space objects possible. The nearest star beyond our solar system is Proxima Centauri. It is about 4.25 light-years away. A light-year is the distance it takes light to travel in one year. Lentz said that using traditional rocket fuel, it would take about 50,000 to 70,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. A trip using nuclear propulsion technology would take about 100 years, he said. But a light-speed trip would take only four years and three months, Lentz added. The researcher's plan promises the hope of faster-than-light-speed travel, which could lead to distant interstellar travel within a human lifetime. Lentz said a lot of work will be needed to make the method become a reality. To be useful, it would require lowering the energy needed down to the level of modern nuclear power reactors. A way to develop and speed up the solitons must also be created, he added. Lentz sees the research and development process as difficult, but not impossible. He said additional steps could happen over the next several years, with a fully operational version possible within the next ten years. He added that the first truly light-speed trips could be tested in the years afterward. I would like to see this technology in use in my lifetime, Lentz said. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. 
If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. We begin the story of President Lyndon Johnson. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Lyndon Baines Johnson became America's 36th president suddenly. Vice President Lyndon Johnson has left the hospital in uh, Dallas. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was murdered. Kennedy and Johnson, his vice president, were in Dallas, Texas. Kennedy was shot as his open car drove through the city. Within a few hours, Johnson was sworn into office. The swearing-in took place on the presidential plane, Air Force One, at Dallas's Love Field. The plane returned to Andrews Air Force Base near Washington, carrying the new president and the body of the former president. At Andrews, President Johnson read a brief statement. He ended with these words, I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God's. Before he was vice president, LBJ had served for many years in the Senate and the House of Representatives. He grew up in small towns in Texas. He finished high school at age 15. He traveled and worked for a few years before he entered Southwest Texas State Teachers College. There, he was a student leader and a political activist. In 1931, a newly elected congressman asked Johnson to work for him as his secretary in Washington. Four years later, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed Johnson as Texas director of Roosevelt's National Youth Administration. Two years after that, in 1937, Johnson won a special election for a seat in the House of Representatives. He served in the House for 12 years. When the United States entered World War II, Johnson was the first member of Congress at that time to volunteer for active duty. After the war, he ran for the Senate, where he also served for 12 years. Johnson loved politics and became an expert in the operations of government. He would need all of that knowledge as president of a nation facing problems near and far. When Johnson took office, communist forces were fighting South Vietnamese troops supported by the United States. Also, there were continuing worries about nuclear war with the Soviet Union. At home, there was racial conflict. Many Americans were out of work, and there was the threat of a railroad strike. Johnson began his presidency by working hard for legislation that President Kennedy had proposed. 
Johnson had voted against civil rights legislation when he served in the Senate. But now he urged Congress to support the idea, and Congress agreed. The 1964 Civil Rights Act barred discrimination against minorities in jobs and in restaurants and other businesses. We believe that all men are created equal, yet many are denied equal treatment. We believe that all men have certain unalienable rights, yet many Americans do not enjoy those rights. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings, not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. The president said that such a situation could not continue in America. To treat people unfairly because of their race, he said, violated the Constitution and the idea of democracy. Lyndon Johnson succeeded in getting Congress to pass more civil rights legislation in 1965 and 68. Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult. But about this, there can and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no reason which can excuse the denial of that right. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. Many southern states used so-called literacy tests as a way to deny blacks the right to vote. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that the day is wrong, or the hour is late, or the official in charge is absent. And if he persists, and if he manages to present himself to the registrar, he may be disqualified because he did not spell out his middle name or because he abbreviated a word on the application. And if he manages to fill out an application, he is given a test. The registrar is the sole judge of whether he passes this test. He may be asked to recite the entire Constitution or explain the most complex provisions of state law. And even a college degree cannot be used to prove that he can read and write. The Civil Rights Act of 1965 said states could not prevent citizens from voting just because they could not read very well. The 1968 law barred discrimination against blacks in housing. Johnson was from the South. That, and his ability to persuade people, helped him get Southern conservatives in Congress to support the civil rights legislation. He also had other ideas for a better America. He called his plan the Great Society. He talked about it in a speech at the University of Michigan. The Great Society rests on abundance and liberty for all. It demands an end to poverty and racial injustice, to which we're totally committed in our time. But that is just the beginning. The Great Society is a place where every child can find knowledge to enrich his mind and to enlarge his talents. Johnson launched the War on Poverty, a series of bills designed to help the poor. But his efforts to pay for social programs and a war overseas led to inflation. 
Vietnam was not the only place where Johnson used military force. In 1965, he sent more than 20,000 troops to intervene in the Dominican Republic. He worried that a revolution could lead to a communist takeover of that Caribbean nation. Lyndon Johnson served the last 14 months of President Kennedy's term. Then, in 1964, he ran for a full term. The Democratic Party strongly supported him and accepted his choice of Hubert Humphrey for vice president. Humphrey was a liberal senator from the state of Minnesota. Unlike the Democrats, the Republicans had a difficult time choosing their presidential candidate. Delegates at the party's nominating convention finally chose Barry Goldwater. Goldwater was a strongly conservative senator from Arizona. Certainly simple honesty is not too much to demand of men in government. And let our republicanism so focused and so dedicated not be made fuzzy and futile by unthinking and stupid labels. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. The Republican candidate for vice president was William Miller, a congressman from New York State. Americans voted in November of 1964. Lyndon Johnson won more than 60% of the popular vote. Still, he had hoped for an even bigger victory. He wanted proof that Americans were voting for him and not the shadow of John Kennedy. In his inaugural speech, Johnson said his great society would never be finished. It would keep growing and improving. I do not believe that the great society is the ordered, changeless, and sterile battalion of the ants. It is the excitement of becoming, always becoming, trying probing, falling, resting, and trying again, but always trying and always gaining. In 1965, he won congressional approval of Medicare, a health insurance program for Americans age 65 and older. President Harry Truman had called for such a plan 20 years earlier. Johnson presented Truman and his wife, Bess, with Medicare cards numbers one and two. Under Johnson, Congress also approved Medicaid, a health care program for the poor and disabled. In 1967, President Johnson appointed the nation's first black justice to the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall. Around the country, President Johnson faced growing opposition to the war in Vietnam. More and more American troops were dying. Lyndon Johnson may have wanted to be remembered as a great president, but the war came to redefine his presidency. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 